Here we go. Uh, so John, what are the primary uh, creative differences in the process from when you worked at Williams? Like, uh, What's different, if anything? Oh, um, I think the first thing is we don't have big teams for support. So um, you have to do a lot yourself. You have to manage uh, art director, creative director, engineering manager, because you just can't afford to have, you know, 10 people on staff um, making Chicago money. You know, Chicago's an expensive town. So, um, so it's been good and bad. The bad of it is, obviously, it takes longer. Some things you have to learn. The good thing is that you develop a good set of uh, other vendors or partners you work with. You understand the process much better. If you have an issue, you'll know what that issue is because you might have specified the type of wood for the cabinet or, or um, set, say, bend allowances on a bracket. Um, when you bend steel, it shrinks or it expands depending on how you're bending it. So you have to kind of factor that in. If someone else is doing it, they would factor that in. But if you do it, all of a sudden the bracket comes back and it doesn't fit. It's like, ah, uh, you know, learning experience. So, <clears throat> and I think um, the whole idea of the digital manufacturing. So, so up until I met Ben Heck, and I always say this, and he, you know, he, he, he turns red, but Ben really helped to make, uh, for me to make the bridge from um, kind of old school um, creating to new school hacking, modding, um, using digital tools, digital printers, 3D printers, all sorts of stuff that is for a pinball designer it's great, but he you know he made it easy to and he you know he's very good at sharing stuff. Oh, I get this made here and buy this and so I think I think um, hanging around Ben and and Charlie over at Spooky, they've. Um, uh, they've really allowed me to have a much better skill set or a palette to work with as a game designer. Um, so it's made it more complicated because things take longer, but I can do more and, um, and then and get that back into the games uh, in a custom way. Well, we, la you know, we laser cut this piece or you know, this bracket is done that way. Or on the play field, we have you know, a lighting truss that does this. Stuff we would never do before because you would have to do tooling and all sorts of stuff where now I can design something, send it out, it'll come back and it'll be this kind of intricate pinball part that I could never make before. So, so um, yeah, so I think so the, the process has changed in, in dozens and dozens of ways, good and bad, uh, but ultimately it's still pinball building is a lot of time, a lot of effort, uh, a lot of noodling, uh, updates, changes. If you want to get above just kind of average or mediocre, you know, if you want to kind of rise above, you you know, you have to redraw artwork, you have to tweak colors, you have to get people looking at stuff, um, you have to just spend time on it, uh, details, um, and kind of go from there. So it's uh, so it's so it so it hasn't gotten easier. You would think with well all your experience and and I've made a whole lot of games. You know I've made five games <clears throat> um, before I started here. But um, you would think it would be easier. But actually it's been much harder. <laughs> it's been the opposite um, because you have um, more carte blanche on creativity time frame. Just uh, yeah yeah. Yeah. And it's creative. I mean, it's 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 custom. It's not well. We're designing for yeah custom. for a specific market and people market or customer. Where before the the market was broader, it just you know we just needed to earn. But I mean, I've had um, a gentleman here, um, one of my customers, Joe, and um, he, he was looking at Magic Girl artwork, and and he you know he was laying on the floor. We had laid out a a play field for him, and he was going through all the line work. Like, you know, because he was so fascinated with how this was, just, it's all just very beautifully drawn. And he, he was just like, and we were watching him on the floor and it's like, what are you doing? And he's like, well, I'm just, you know, and, like, and then he'd find stuff. Well, what's that? I, you know, he'd find an initial, somebody's initial, or he'd find something hidden <laughs> in the artwork. Um, so so the, the customers are looking for it. 
and they they kind of appreciate and understand the effort it takes to kind of get it to that level um, so where if you just kind of did it then they would kind of uh, it just looks like you did it you just you just hammered it out you're done it's off the list but I know it could be better and so then that kind of haunts you you're basically selling your customer an, like an inferior not your best work so they've asked me to do my best work in this case so I'm knowingly selling them not my best work if I don't change something or update it if I know it's just you know that thing is sticking out it needs to be changed you know within a you know reasonable kind of limit but so 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 then I don't sleep now because I know I'm kind of you know it's just not the best so and so the pros and cons of doing a boutique game versus a mass production game are basically it's you, you're making what you want to make yeah well it and, takes longer so you know uh, that's hard the old days you had a time limit you had to be in production in this day or you know or it's like big trouble um, obviously it takes it takes um, more just like mind energy to do this you have to get up every day you have to be excited about it um, doesn't matter what's going on you have to be kind of ready to go and there's nobody to kind of pick up so you you know I can't just hand a drawing off to the cable department and you know Williams we had like four or six guys in the cable department and they would just you know go and they would come back later in the week oh we got it all done they're all drawn here's a sample and you know you will have whatever the next 20 they'll be in in two weeks so all that was off your plate you would just you know then we go for lunch where now it's not like that so you have to follow up you have to do drawings for everything part numbers um, work with vendors quotes some vendors will do a no quote basically um, because you don't order enough so you might find a perfect vendor to make your part but they'll say oh we're not interested or they'll just highball you well that part is going to be you know x dollars and because they just want you to go away because you're not ordering 5,000 brackets. Right. So, so. And I was wondering what are, what are the most um, time consuming parts of the process uh, doing your fir the first game or first games um, as an independent manufacturer? Like what? Oh, well, I think in this case, um, um, you know, when I started, I, I didn't really give thought to everything that would need to be done because you're excited and we're going to do a game. And then all of a sudden it's like, Oh, there's no cabinet. Oh, there's no, you know, power supply. Oh, how's the play field? Oh, where are these brackets going to come from? Oh, we can't buy that part. Oh, and, and now you have to, you know, design a game and then uh, figure out how to get it engineered, build the, the platform cabinet. How's the artwork going to be done? How are you going to print it? Um, I mean, and it just kind of compounds uh, on top of just wanting to do a game. You have all these other items, these kind of foundation items or building blocks that have to be figured out somehow. And um, so I thought in some cases, some current vendors in the pinball world would kind of help out, but it turned out like not at all. They just said, you know, thank you, but no thanks. So we had to go and, and um, figure this out. So, so pinball play field, for example, um, it you know, took us eight months from start to finish to get it all engineered where the people that do make pinball play fields would have had me one back in two weeks. So, so your drawing board from being a designer to a, you know, the, the owner of a pinball company, the drawing board gets bigger. You have more things to, to work on. You yeah, have yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's definitely many challenging. Hats, many hats. Many but hats. ultimately, in this case, people... You, you are judged for what is the game going to look like or how is it going to play or how it, does the cabinet feel solid or what type of trim are you using for this or what type of steel are you using for that part so it comes down to again that high concept of what you're building what does it look like what are the colors um, and everything else is not important at the beginning and people won't go any farther if they don't kind of like all those those kind of elements so it's uh, 
Yeah, so you have to you have to not forget about them. You can't just be the engineer working on brackets because people aren't going to see brackets till later on. They're going to see what does the playfield art look like? How many inserts do you have? Or you know what new features are on the playfield? Um, how many ramps? How many magnets? Those are questions I get all the time. And how does it feel when you play it? I mean, you can't answer that. You can't answer it until you play it, but. You know. Well, my games have a certain style. Um, I like up-down games, so I call it the shot to the top. I think I learned that from, um, like, Python or Barry Ausler or Mark Ritchie. Um, I like s flow uh, from playing Steve Ritchie's games. And then I think also uh, Pat Lawler's games. He There's just... Um, I, I, I'm not sure what it is. It's, it's kind of like a mechanicalness to the game. The ball drops on a metal, you know, thing under the play field and goes clank or it goes somewhere else and there's just this kind of imaginative way in, in Pat's case that he lays it out. So so my style is kind of a mix of of what I do but then also kind of a 70s mix, some flow, some, you know, some Python, some Pat Lawler and I have my own style. Um, and it has all those elements in the design. So it's not just a game with just ramp shots, ramp shots, ramp shots. I'll spend time moving rubbers, watching side action, um, holding the ball, giving the person a rest. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's, um, it's, it's complicated, but it's subtle because you can change a few things and um, you know, all of a sudden the game doesn't play as well. And I like to have just visual or kind of obvious things that people, because nobody reads the rule card, we do these rule cards, but if you have something on the play field that someone can uh, shoot at or make do something, create some transformation, then that's like universal. So they know, well, if I hit this thing three times, well, that little thing pops up. And then when it pops up, if I hit it, it does this. And then when I lose my ball, those things reset again. But you've now taught them, you know, well, if you do this, this happens. And then if you do that, this happens. And then now they can go explore something else. And, and that comes from Nintendo. That's uh, kind of Nintendo and Sega. Uh, if you play Sonic the Hedgehog or the original ones, um, uh, Miyamoto would teach just a basic... Um, way in his games that well if you do this this happens if you do this this happens and then as a player you build up these different things as you move through a level and um, you know and those little elements together weren't very complicated but when you put them all together they become more powerful so um, so those games are very addictive and um, they're very easy to play and then you take it as far as you want and you know my games have always been in the middle so um, they're, they're not like too simple but not too complicated because I had to design games to, for women to play, for people to play, everybody around the world and I'm not, you know, I don't want to play a pinball game for an hour um, I'll just play, you know, for enough time and then I'm done and do something else so, so I think my style's always been like that and some people like it and some people don't like it. But interesting enough, you know, I get a lot of calls, people are looking for Theater Magics, they're looking for Circus Voltaires, they're looking for Tales of the Arabian Nights, and all of those games have a, a rule set that's just kind of in the middle, but the people at home like them, the wives like them, the kids like them. They're visually interesting and they know it's not a game I'm going to play an hour on, I'm going to play some games. Leave it turned on. It looks very nice. I'm going to go, you know, play something else. So, so it's it's a it's designed to be played kind of a certain way, and um, and you know, and that's like my style. So people say, well, you know, if it, it needs to have better rules than you know, Totan, Tales of Arabian Nights. Well, you know, Totan, it was that was the best game we could build at the time. The game earned like. A lot of money per week, you know, between um, three twenty-five and four hundred dollars a week, and that was in the downslope because you know Theater Magic earned more. A lot of those games, but um, but the point is, the game was designed to fit with a certain type of a customer, to earn a certain amount of money, and have you know things on the play field to entertain them, 
especially if they were, you know, slightly inebriated or say there's a bunch of girls out on a night out playing pinball. You know, they don't want to feel kind of intimidated. They just want to, you know, shoot the ball around, make some stuff happen, and kind of off they go. So, so code and rule set wise with the games you're working on now is where are you going with that? Kind of the middle road, you know, just kind of... Yeah, yeah and I think too, um, I've been trying to do a little more, um, I call it like like power, power rule building or power ups. Yes. So in Magic Girl, you, you know, you, you, you play the game and you, you build up, you know, your magic power and then once you have a certain level of magic power, then you can, other parts of the game activate. Ah, okay. Kind of. And it, but again, that's the Steve Ritchie rule. That's like Flash. You hit the targets that the big hot dog, the blue one, you know, or the crescent it lights up. And you kind of know it's, you know, you've kind of come up a level, you get more points, and then the game goes back down again. And Pitbull used to do that where you'd, you'd be at a lower tempo, then the game would speed up, the music would speed up, something, the lights would speed up. You know, you're getting more and more points, and then you lose the ball, and then it goes back down again. And and because you just can't play a game that's just you know all the time, because you're not varying kind of the ups and downs of if I'm am I doing better, am I not doing better? Um, so in Arabian, you know, we had the the bonus lights, and that was we copied that from Playboy. Do 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 the game from the seventies from Bally. So you just know the more I spin it, the more bonus I get. The more bonus I get, you're going to hear it count when your ball is gone. So if you and I are playing, I'm going to sit there, and this thing's going to it's going to do its bonus countdown. Um, and it, and it may not be more points, but it feels like I'm doing better, which is like an old pinball thing. I had more lights on, it made more music, it did more stuff. Yours just went quickly, and you're done. Um, so again, it's that the psychology of pinball that a lot of that stuff is lost now. You know, bonus, um, skill shot, extra ball. Um, you know, I don't like ball saver. I'm always arguing. You know, you don't need ball saver. All you need is if you don't get any points, you get your ball back. Right. So if you're right, right. if you happen to shoot the ball and you don't get one point or you know a hundred points, but you need to learn to flip better. Right. You need to learn the skills of pinball. It's, and it keeps it exciting. If I keep getting ball save, right. ba -ba -ba -ba, well, okay, I just got seven balls for my 50 cents. Well, each ball is not important anymore. It's, it's, and the, there's a term called justifying bad behavior. Like, oh, you can just keep draining it. Oh, whatever. I just mm. keep. So the term justifying bad behavior. Yeah. Like, and I think Circus was the only game with the automatic ball kicking thing in the. Um, in the uh, shooter lane, you right. know, Cameron wanted that on, so we put it on. But it's like, you know, I'm. You, it's a three ball game. It's three balls. If you get an extra ball, that's good. That's like a big deal, kind of. So, so I'm kind of, you know, a little bit old school that way. That, that kind of uh, <clears throat> leaves me wondering if um, if your games are going to be coded with, you know, for for it to be coin operated, and if anybody. That's ordered any of your games, uh, you know, uh, Zombie Adventureland, or uh, are we gonna route it? If anybody said, "Hey, I wanna, I'm gonna route this game," or is it basically for home use? Is it? Yeah, what's what we tell people? I mean, it's built. We're building our games to arcade quality, right? But you know, we're not. You know, we're not in kind of the pinball factory business. Uh, be curious if they make any more money. So if we put a Magic Girl out I just wondered, yeah. at GameWorks and it earns more than the current lineup of games, then, like, why is that? You know, I would want to know, like, well, what is it about it? Is it the artwork? Is it the screen? Is it <coughs> lighting? You know, because then that would be the clue, maybe how to get games earning more right. to then make games so operators will buy more because they're actually going to make more money but it just seems pinball makes a certain amount yeah. per week it doesn't matter if you have a live monkey well, actually a live monkey in the back box would probably earn more but um, they just you know it just it, they all make the same supposedly Wizard of Oz makes more um, but I don't know I mean if I made a if I made a pinball game and, and um, say Magic Girls earn 300 a week just wherever we put them out on right. test I mean, I would want to tell people that, that, hey, you know, 
we've something in this game and allows it to earn more, so maybe we can make a future game kind of like an operator version. So we make a game that's just for operator, some other title. And then whatever we've learned on you know on Magic Girl we'll put into that game because it earns two point five times or three times more than any other pinball game. And try and, you know, figure that out. But So in the future you you're not against like trying a game on location just to test it like a like a bar arcade and you know where you know people actually would go and yeah, play. Yeah, be interesting. Yeah, we're we're not quite there yet, but um but you know, I mean, I think our business, you know, I it's 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 good to be small. I get to know my customers. We really get to get into pinball design. Um it doesn't make it easier, but I think we we get to be a little truer to the art form, a little tr- truer to the tradition. So I think that's and uh, George Gomez and I would always we, we called King for the day. That right now we're the we're the like the custodians of pinball. So until the new group takes over, we have to make sure we're keeping the traditions alive, bringing them forward, and tr- trying to you know inspire others to do this because there's only a handful of pinball builders, pinball makers, and only a handful of pinball designers. It's not like there's the you know convention of pinball designers and 250 people show up it's like it's the same you know 12 of us or 15 of us it's a very small group so so we have um we have a responsibility to do these things so and i think we do in our games we spend more time we look back at older games we bring traditions forward things that are dead you know we bring them forward um and kind of keep it going so like the rollover button you know first thing i did on world cup is i went back we re-engineered the rollover button. Well, I mean, the new Stern game has a rollover button. The Jer- you know, the Wizard of Oz has rollover buttons. I mean, you know, it's kind of we went back to a part that was dead for you know 15 years. It hadn't wasn't on a game. All of a sudden, you know, oh, that's cool. And it was you know, it took a while to get it done, but um, you know, so I think it's good to go back and uh, kind of do things like that. And then giving back, yeah, there's the pinball school that you're working on. Yeah, yeah. Part of, I think part of what I would like to do is is teach and just just share the knowledge what I've learned. And it's not you know, and obviously I don't know everything, but I have I have my view on it, my take on how I do games. Um, so that's valid. It's relevant, and um, I think it's good to pass it along, especially in the game creating because the games are very complex well how do you start a game how do you how do you begin what do you pick what do you do first how does you know how does all this come together you know i could see it here but how do you start from a blank sheet over here and get all that way and um you know the old days was just we would just do a play field if it shot well they would put some artwork on it and you were kind of done where now it's it's very intertwined it's very complicated how do you you know how do you do this in a, you know, in a relatively short time frame, because if not, it's just going to be again average or mediocre. So in my case, as a boutique maker or custom maker, you know, there's five other people that are making a similar product. Um, so therefore, I have to differentiate what I do, um, and and just try and make the games as good as I can make them from from you know my building experience. Um, and this is kind of what we build. So when a customer is making a choice in the future, he might say, well, I'm going to you know, buy one game and I'm going to pick this game because of these reasons. It might be theme or it might be I like the artwork or I like the extra details in the game or I like the, you know, whatever it might be. Um, you know, so people are, people are making choices now what they're buying. People aren't buying everything like they were two or three years ago. And uh, why why is pinball to you? Why is it still cool and relevant? Um, <clears throat> I I don't know how to do anything else. <laughs> I don't know how to do anything else. No, no. I think um, we grew up in pinball, so I think I think when you play pinball, it takes you back to you know a, a time uh, long ago. And I grew up in you know big arcades, um, lots of games. There's certain noise, kind of a din that you know that goes on, and um, we learned about. Uh, all sorts of things through pinball. It's it's very hard to explain, and then you get kind of like addicted or entranced, or we're not sure. I'm not the only one that has this problem, um, you know. But I think also, like I look at it now, like it's kind of my duty to do this, and you know, I get 
flamed all the time on the boards. I get beat up. Um, and, but I, I think it's, I really, I, I need to do this to keep it going until, you know, it kind of gets picked up and, uh, or it goes away, you know, one or the other. So, so it is an art form and it is a, 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 a great piece of Americana. So as again, you know, we're kings for the day, we're the custodians, we're part of the Pinball Museum, which is, you know, around the world. So, um, and I can't do anything else. So. And, and when things go well and, and games sell and, and, you know, more and more uh, attention comes to uh, pinball and more sp specifically your craft. And uh, I, I believe it's going to become popular because of its craftsmanship. Um, do you believe in time that there is enough um, of a growing base of fans to support um, pinball as it is to keep it alive? You know, it, yeah, I think we're at the boundaries. I think the the two big makers they're they're kind of at their limits of how many games they can sell. Um, I think the games are expensive, so people only have so much money to um, uh, to buy a pinball game. It is a luxury item. It's kind of like collecting LCD TVs. I mean, how many you know eighty two inch LCD TVs do you need? Um, yeah, so I think I think we're kind of at the limits. Um, so it's good. So in my case, I can fit in because I don't need to, and I don't want to run large runs of games. Uh, I might make more money, and it might be better financially, but um, there really isn't a place for someone to do that. And um, and I think also, I think there's just you know the pinball is not. It's kind of a retro thing now. It's kind of a subculture thing. It's it's not in the popular culture. You right. Know, in my neighborhood of families and kids and all that, nobody plays pinball. Nobody has a pinball machine, uh, or one neighbor did, except us. So the kids come over and they're like, "Wow, this is great!" Because they're all used to their iPhones, and um, but it's not, you know. And there's nowhere to play pinball. You can't. I mean, you go to Chuck E. Cheese, most of the sports bars and that don't have pinball. They have darts, they have pool tables, things like that. Uh, pinball you have to find, you have to go find it. Um, even if you go to Gameworks, here in Chicago we have the big test location, Gameworks. Well, all the pinballs are upstairs, so all the little kids play downstairs, there's no pinball down there. Right. You know, it's all upstairs by the bar, you know, or it used to be by the bar, I think they moved it. but. It's with the video games, so you have all the shooting video games, and then next to them you have pinball. But all the new pinball players, the two-year-olds, three-year-olds, you know, I started playing at five. They're all downstairs at Gameworks, and there's no pinball downstairs. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing for them to get hooked on in that case. And that's typical. You know, it's typical across America, um, you know, all over. So so I think it's it's... It's 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 its own thing. It's kind of like custom bike building. Only so many people are going to buy a motorcycle or a chopper. And there's different guys you can go to. Um, some do mass-produced bikes that are less money. Others do. They'll do a one-off. It'll cost you ten times more. Some are artists. Some are, you know, designers, painters. Um, so it's very much like that. Specific customer. They want that product, and they understand the different parts of the product that they like and. Um, and kind of go from there. So it's so it's very much a niche kind of a, a kind of a thing. But it's important because you know pinball in Chicago anyway. Pinball kind of you know was born in Chicago, and um, there's lots of history. A lot of the same vendors and companies are still open. You can drive around like uh, our studio is off Lake Street here. Lake Street's famous street. You could take that all the way into the city. Uh, go by the old Gottlieb plant was off Lake Street. Um, if I go a little farther down before I get to the lake. Um, one of the companies, um, uh, Pacific Amusements from California, where they made Contact and other games in the 30s, they had a factory off Lake Street. So, so this one street here is, is has this historic pinball kind of thing happening that's been since the beginning of pinball. So that's cool. Is that part of why you chose where, the, where you work, where this spot or this area? Or? Um, no, I think a lot of us live out here. Yeah. So, the, and I always tell people the the mecca of pinball is now out here in the suburbs. 
it's moved from downtown, so a lot of the people I work with are out here. Uh, the vendors are out here. Um, so the spirit of pinball has moved out here. So. I'm a I'm a collector operator. I have 13 pinball machines out from skateboard record shops, tattoo places, movie theaters, and in about a month, a friend's building an arcade next to his video game shop, and I it dawned on me a few days ago. I I was at the bar, one of the bar locations and. Uh, I'm 33. I can tell they're mid. They're mid 20s, and I can tell it dawned on me that it's not. It's more so the millennials, like people from 21 to to 32, 31, that are playing my game. So it seems like that that's the range. It's it's always in my lifetime. I've seen that. That's most people that play out in the you know out in bars or restaurants. Right. Well, I noticed too time. a lot of the millennials. If they had a parent that was in the business. So a lot of them had a dad who was a collector, maybe a dad that worked at one of the companies, some family connection to pinball. Then they grew up as a kid. They might have had a pinball game at home or had some you know, other thing going on. So I find a lot of them, there's a kind of a connection between um, them and their family and, and, um, and pinball. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it's hard. It's one thirty-five. so... Rock and roll. We'll wrap it up. Thank <laughs> you very much. You're not going to make it. Oh, no. We can continue it. It's, uh... Oh, yeah. I, uh... That was my intention at, at, if, if it went over. Um, but, yeah, we'll just wrap it up. And, um... Is there anything you'd like to tell, um... Buyers of games, perspective... You know, per, you know perspective buyers of games, uh... About, you know, the, the work you're doing and, uh... The, 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 well, I mean, we're... we're you know, I'm doing this, and how mushy this sounds, we're doing it to make uh, pinball better, the community better, and so it's definitely not for personal gain. I've been very lucky um, to work on games, work with very talented teams. Um, if you go to the Internet Pinball Database, they have a top ten of solid state games. Three of my games are on that list. They've been on it the last four years. Um, people like those games so so I've had success so I don't need to go and and stand on the podium again and tell everybody how great I am we're really trying to focus on what we're building um, first and so I don't mind um, whatever comes my way as far as uh, good comments or bad comments from people we're really trying to keep pinball strong in our little way and try and have a business model that works and it's uh, it's all very difficult it's very challenging and um, yeah it's it's just it's definitely it's not <clears throat> like a quick cash grab thing let's get in there let's soak everybody because they like pinball and it's actually the opposite. It's let's try and build something better we, than we built before in a small way that fits in the whole model now. Because, you know, we have a certain model of the business that works, and there's only room for a few makers. There's not, you know. So you're ba is it that you're basically making what you want for people who want it? That's basically the... Yeah, you're for the market. Yeah, you know that sounds market. like kind of cold. I wouldn't say it's what I want. It's it's well, creative wise, it's, you know, you're uh, you're creating the game that you want to make that that you believe is fun well, I, and and I'm trying to create the game that I and, that I think people want me to create. Ah, okay. So it's a little bit more. So you're creating for them. Yeah, absolutely. So that that's that, that's what it's, the the end in mind is that you're making what people want. That's that's the what I think they want. You think they want? Yeah. What, okay. And then you get their feedback, so you you can kind of solidify that you are making it what they want. Or I'm on the right direction. Right direction. Yeah. So it's very it's very um, you know it's just very kind of squeaky and mushy, but that's really the truth. It's absolutely not what I want to make. Okay. Obviously, I I like to make things a certain way. Right. But I really people like that. I'm really trying to get the arrow on the target to what do people really want that's different in pinball that they would want to buy that they can't get today. 
So obviously, if they want a you know a Marvel or a, a game with a movie theme, there you know they, there are places they can go to buy that. If they want a hand drawn original game, like we used to make in the '90s, you know less people are doing that. So it's um, yeah, that's that's the truth. And I think and I I think there's a place in the pinball world for that type of product. There's people that want it, and right. they want that more than anything else. That you know they're yes. they and they have that money ready. The, the money is ready for that product. And if they weren't going to spend on that product, they'd spend it on something else. Like just, they would just buy. It would just, some, sit, it would just sit in their bank account, probably. A, a lot of people I've met, they buy games and they leave them in the box. So they'll get into a buying frenzy. Some game will be released on a Tuesday, pre-order, or it'll be you know whatever it is. And because their friends are buying it, oh. they will buy it. And then they go on the forum, they tell everybody, oh yeah, I bought one. But really, when you talk to them four months later, they haven't opened it, they don't play it, and they're looking to sell it. Wow. So they just want to be in the crowd. And so mine's a little more like, well, I want you to spend your money, support the business because you like what we're building. Right. It somehow gets you excited, it motivates you, it's cool, whatever it might be. Not just because it's the next new thing. Um, it's a fun collectible. It's not just a collectible. It's a collect- yeah. collecting aspect. They get it because it's fun. And I I think people, yeah. for the most part, buy a pinball machine because it's fun. Yeah, there are people who buy it just to collect, but I think right. most people buy it because it's fun. Yep. And it doesn't hurt that it's collectible. So, <laughs> yeah. So, well, thank you very much. And uh, have a great time at Expo. Okay. Uh, Was it recording? <laughs> yep. Imagine that if it wasn't. <laughs>